Hello, everyone. This is a lesson number three uh, of our um, operations management course here at King's University College at Western University in Canada. So uh, this is part of our uh, MOS 3330 operations management. And today's lesson is called process analysis. Uh, and uh, it refers mostly to chapter three uh, from Cachon's book in operations management. Uh, so what are our learning objectives today? So we're gonna learn how to draw a process flow. Very important, that's the very first step. Uh, then we're gonna determine capacity for a very simple one-step process. Then we're gonna find out uh, flow rates, utilization, and cycle times, and why we need to know all those metrics with respect to any process. Um, and very importantly, uh, when we figure out multi-step processes, we need to find bottlenecks. Those are the steps in a process that um, constrain. Um, they constrain our operation. They limit uh, our ability to generate cash flow. Um, and if we go back <clears throat> to the idea uh, that we have the statement of earnings, where in the very top line we have sales, this being our demand, and then immediately afterwards we have cogs, this being in part our process and our inventory, finding bottlenecks are basically figuring out which one of these two are in fact limiting our operation, our ability to um, generate profits and, and cash flows, and then determine how long it takes to produce a certain order quantity. Uh, so um, in every class, I will uh, talk a little bit about these things, but let, let's always remember that if you can't measure, you can't manage. Uh, so today's lesson is will be very focused on the idea of measuring processes and be able to understand uh, their role in the overall process of your organization. Also, the process triangle of inventory, uh, capacity, and variability, understanding how those three things they work combined. And if there's a mismatch between uh, your supply and your demand, uh, things are gonna start to um, become a little less efficient. Inventory will become waste, variability will increase, and capacity will eventually um, become very constrained with very high utilization rates. And most importantly, the idea that if we are to be analyzing processes, that's with the intention of uh, improving our process, right? And continuous improvement is the key. There is always a cycle of continuous improvement. You plan, do, check, and act, or you can work in DMake if you want to, but the idea is every time, every time that you analyze a process, you've got to question, question yourself and think, is there a better way of doing this? Okay. So <clears throat> moving on. I want to hide this a little bit. Hide meeting controls. Okay. So how to draw a process flow diagram. So the idea is it creates a visual chart. It's a representation. It's a model of your process. Uh, we should be able to define each one of the steps, um, name them properly, figure out how much, um, re how many resources we need uh, within each one of these uh, processes. And later on, we're gonna be seeing a little bit about working process inventory as well. And the idea is that process analysis is a framework to understand the details of the operation. 
in any kind of business, be it a um, be it a, a service or a manufacturing, it doesn't matter. It's always about understanding that operation, the process behind uh, your business. So it can be used by anyone uh, and it will be uh, very much focused on finding out what the process capacity is also known, you know, the number of flow units that can be processed per unit of time and understanding the utilization of your uh, resources. Um, we don't want to have idle resources in our organization. It means um, perhaps you spent too much money building capacity. Perhaps you're spending too much money in wages. Um, you don't want excess idle capacity in your organization. You want to be able to match your demand uh, with your supply. So we need to figure out if the sta stages in our process um, are matching what uh, the demand for our products and services are. Uh, and we can do that uh, understanding the utilization of those resources. So the most basic way you can um, draw a process flow diagram is by using these three very simple uh, symbols. Triangles represent inventory. Uh, oftentimes we call this working process inventory. Um, arrows depict flows and boxes depict resources or work centers or workstations. Um, the idea is um, you understand how um, the units move within your process. And later on, we're gonna be seeing a little bit more about the idea that the more the flow <clears throat> has variation and the more the resources and the service times or the processing times have variations, the higher, will be our work in process inventory. Uh, so we can observe this from Little's law. If inventory equals flow rate times flow time, as time goes up, meaning there's more variance in this process, you would expect inventory also to go up. The same thing um, uh, with flow rates, okay? So we'll be seeing a little bit more of that when we go into queuing theory. But for now, let's understand that whatever metrics we have, capacity we have, we're talking about averages. So by averages, I mean it is over time, it's relatively constant. The averages don't change. So we are in a steady state. So for example, this is the first step. Uh, we're, let's assemble a sandwich, fast food uh, sandwich, um, <clears throat> fast food chain. Uh, these are the steps required to assemble a sandwich. You might want to think about them uh, having one employee uh, assembling the entire sandwich or having uh, multiple employees assembling uh, only um, uh, groups and steps of each one of those activities, right? So here in Canada, you could think, for example, um, sandwich assembly at Harvey's, where you have a single employee assembling your whole sandwich, uh, compared, for example, to uh, Subway or even uh, Mr. Sub, where you have uh, different steps uh, and different employees assembling different parts of your sandwich, okay? So once you've listed all those activities, uh, you can put them in order. Uh, so you got a list activities. Uh, you got to uh, create uh, precedence between those activities, and then you can move on. So building a sandwich, how does that go? What would be a flow unit? of uh, building a sandwich. So you can think in terms of uh, sandwiches per day, but uh, you can also think in terms of customers. 
because ultimately when you're observing the, the sandwich assembly um, process, you, you can see customers waiting, you can see customers moving around. Um, so uh, perhaps uh, you should think in terms of what it is that you want to capture within that, that process. Uh, and the key here is that customer in the sandwich assembly line is actually your inventory. So uh, they're waiting in line, they're waiting to be uh, processed to receive their meals. And um, that makes a lot of sense. And we will see later on that uh, those weights have to do with imbalances in the arrival patterns of demand and processing times in service. So a little bit of definition, upstream means in the beginning, the initial uh, assembly, and downstream uh, refers to uh, the end of the assembly. And those are all relative positions that you have to think about. Um, so when whatever, if you are within a stage an intermediary uh, stage, it, these are all relative positions, right? So if you are over here, upstream is everything that happened before uh, this one particular uh, process and downstream anything that happens um, immediately uh, afterwards. And these things are relative to the position uh, of, the <coughs> of the process that you're in uh, right now. So, for example, this could be um, the sandwich uh, assembly uh, process uh, with three stations. Uh, you have customers waiting in the beginning. So customers arrive over here. Uh, they wait for station one. You, you're asked about your bread, what kind of protein you want and whatnot. And then uh, you move along into second station where there's all the, the deal with what you're gonna do with your cheese and whatnot and, um, and salads. And then eventually you're going to the cashier and you pay and then you leave, okay? So there was, this will be a very basic uh, process flow diagram. There could be many, many, many others. So uh, this one example, you have three arrivals. Uh, they're independent, they don't communicate to each other and they're serviced by different uh, and parallel uh, servers. So this, for example, this could be a grocery store uh, where customers join li different lines and are serviced by uh, different uh, cashiers. Uh, another one, for example, could be uh, customers arriving into a switch box and then they're transferred to whomever is uh, idle at the time or whomever becomes available at the time. So this could be, for example, a call center. Um, and, and then you can have mixed of things uh, all throughout, including uh, networks. So when you're seeing the process, you, um, you want to draw diagrams in a way that they become flexible and you can um, decide on what areas of the process you want to study, right? Sometimes you want to focus on a particular uh, uh, place, a particular location in your inventory. Um, so drawing the process flow should always, always, always be in the beginning steps of your process analysis. It helps you understand what is going on. It helps you visualize what's happening um, in your operation. There will always be many different processes to analyze uh, and you have to be extra careful defining your flow units. Uh, ideally, you wanna have a single flow unit all throughout your process, but sometimes um, you, gotta, you gotta be able to divide uh, into sub assemblies to make a little bit more sense uh, of your process. <clears throat> okay. So here's a very basic one, capacity for a one-step process. Um, you, you have a process time, processing time uh, for a single uh, process. There's a single step 
Um, <clears throat> and we can always uh, think about this as a black box of some sort, right? Uh, so you can look at this from the perspective of a hospital, a patient goes into the hospital, is admitted, uh, and leaves the hospital. So the hospital is a single one, big one step process, or you can uh, divide each one um, of the activities that were taken over there and locations where the patient uh, stayed and so forth. The same thing, for example, a car assembly, uh, you can think in terms of overall assembly as opposed to each one of the steps. Um, now, very, very important, very, very important. Uh, always think of these in terms of averages, okay? We, we wanna work with averages and we understand averages, uh, particularly because as we introduce variation in the process, um, these will eventually lead to inventory. Uh, so I cannot stress this enough. Uh, as you increase variance in the system, inventory will go up. And we know this already because of the process triangle. Right? Uh, so there you go, capacity for a one step process. So let's build a sandwich and a single, um, a single server, a single employee is uh, gonna build your sandwich. Uh, so you can check each one of these steps is taken by a single individual, single employee. And overall, as you sum these up, you know it takes uh, 120, 120 seconds per customer, okay? Uh, this is what, this would be the processing time. So let's keep in mind, what if our demand is 40 units per hour? So what if my um, 40 customers arrive to this one particular store uh, per hour, and I have a processing time of 120 seconds per customer. So let's see what happens. <clears throat> so let's define the capacity. So the capacity of a process is the maximum number of flow units that can flow through a resource per unit of time. So very important capacity capacity equals to one over P, okay? Uh, for a single server case, when we have multiple servers, um, we do this a little bit differently, but for now, that's all we know. So we, we know that it takes 120 seconds per customer. So if capacity is one over uh, processing time, this will take one over 120 customers per second or 0.008333 customers per second. Um, this is done intentionally. What does 0.008333 represent? It doesn't represent anything, right? It's really hard to grasp uh, that measurement in terms of capacity. So perhaps what we could do is to think about this in a different uh measurement of time. So why not uh, we think about this in terms of, for example, of uh, customers per minute. So how would I go about doing this? Well, you know, you multiply this by 60 seconds per minute, this device with this guy, then uh, what you get over here is 0 0.5 customers per minute, right? Uh, so half a customer per minute, that's still not a good measurement. So maybe you wanna multiply this again by 60 minutes in one hour. Uh, so this cancels with this. So when you do that, you find that you have 30 customers per hour. That is your capacity. So your capacity is 30 customers per hour. This is much simpler to understand than this. So you always have to be careful about what kind of measurements you have in a way that you can understand reality, you can grasp reality in your mind. So the process capacity is the maximum flow rate a process can uh, 
<clears throat> provide per unit of time. So remember, flow rate per unit of time. So this determines the maximum supply of the process. So remember, we got to match demand with supply. We, we have to be able to do these two things. So if we define our process capacity, we have one side um, of the uh, situation. Now we've got to figure out uh, what's going to happen with respect to, to demand. So the process capacity is always the smallest, smallest capacity of all resources in the process. So let me be clear when I'm, when I'm talking about this. Uh, you cannot force things through uh, your process, okay? So it's always the smallest capacity. It doesn't matter if there's 100 units coming here per hour, uh, but my capacity is only 90 units per hour. Uh, what you will observe will not be 100. At the end of this process over here at the exit, you're not going to be observing 100 uh, units per hour. What you will be observing will be 90 units uh, per hour. So it's always the smallest capacity you have, even uh, if things are coming from processes upstream. Okay. So the demand rate is the number of flow units that customers want. So this is your demand. And then you may want to think about this when you're computing flow rate utilization cycle time is to think maybe there are processes that they are capacity constrained. Uh, what that means is your demand is greater than your cap process capacity, right? Or um, you have demand constrained uh, processes. This is the case when the demand is smaller than your capacity here you have idle uh, time, here you have empty utilization, you have idle resources. And when we talk about throughput, basically what we're saying is flow rate. So the number of flow units flowing through a process per unit per time. So throughput, throughput is units per time, okay? So let's think first in terms of utilization. So the utilization is a ratio between the flow rate, how fast the process is currently operating, and the process capacity, how fast the process could be oper operating if there was sufficient demand. So review what we had before. We knew that demand was 40 uh, customers per hour, and we just defined that our capacity is 30 units per hour. So we got to figure out first, what is our flow rate? So our flow rate will always be the minimum between your demand and your capacity. So in this case, it's going to be the minimum between 40 and 30, which obviously is 30. So remember, when I drew this before, we have a demand arriving over here. Uh, there's a little bit of inventory, and then there's a process, and then you leave. So if there are 40 customers per hour arriving here, and my capacity is only 30 customers per hour, what I will observe at the end of this process is 30 customers per hour. Okay? So... This is my flow rate, what I'm observing at the end of this process. So how do I calculate the utilization rate? Uh, it will be the flow rate divided by the capacity. So I know the flow rate is 30, the capacity is 30. Uh, notice that this is 30 customers per hour divided by 30 customers per hour. So one measurement cancels with the other one, so you end up having a, a utilization without any kind of unit of measurement. So this just represents in this particular case, 100% utilization. You're busy all the time. This could be very troublesome. 
um, especially if you're considering in terms of maintenance, in terms of employee burnout. So this is a process that cannot stop, right? Um, also note that uh, utilization is a great way to figure out bottlenecks in any assembly line. Uh, steps of the process that have the highest utilization will be uh, your bottleneck, okay? So now another very, very important um, measurement is what we call cycle time. So cycle time is the time between completing two consecutive flow units. So it's the time between two units. Again, we have a process, there's an arrival, here's a little bit of inventory, here's your process, and then you're observing the end of this process and one unit are, uh, is done over here, time will pass, and then another unit will come around. So this interval of time t is your cycle time. Uh, why is this important? Your cycle time is the beat. This is the pace of production, okay? So, um, if you know what your cycle time is, as an operations manager, you basically um, know the, um, the heart rate of your process. So if by any chance you're observing the end of the line and, um, for example, you are expecting the following, this, um, 120 seconds per customer. So you observe one client leaving or one uh, unit finishing uh, assembly, 120 seconds later, another one, 120 seconds later, another one, and then 180 seconds, another one. So, so customer number one, customer number two, this took 120, Number three, another 120. From three to four, took 180 seconds. Right now, you can go to your assembly line or you can go to your process and check what is wrong because you understand that the pace of production or the pace of service should be 120 seconds. Uh, this should be a red alert and you can intervene and you can make a decision right away. So very importantly, cycle time, therefore, is one divided by flow rate. Flow rate is measured in, cuffs, in units per time. Cycle time is time per units. It's the in-between, in-between uh, customers leaving your process, customers leaving your, your, sh your shop, um, calls being finished in your call center, patients leaving the hospital, uh, cars leaving the assembly line. This is the pace. And uh, I would like to stress this a little bit because there is a interesting um, methodology in operations management called theory of constraints that talks about the beat, the drum, in a process, the pace in a process. So um, cycle time relates to that. Um, and we can always talk a little bit more about that later on. This is the pace, the in interval of time between two consecutive uh, flow units leaving your process. So wait up, so what's cycle time and what's lead time? Cycle time is one over flow rate. So it's, un it's expressed in units per time. Lead time is the time between when an order is placed and when it's received. So the process lead time, in other words, is your flow time. So remember from Little's law, inventory is your flow rate times your flow time. So this is lead time, okay? And one over cycle time. 
equals inventory. So these are two separate things. When your, your customer, when placing an order with you, may not be very interested in what your cycle time is, but uh, your customer will definitely be interested in when he or she will be receiving their order or when he or she will be done processing, right? So that is lead time. Cycle time is more of an internal uh, operation measurement. Lead time is useful for delivery information for your client, for external, uh, for your partners in your supply chain, while cycle time is uh, interesting for you uh, as an operations manager to control the pace, the rhythm of your um, process or assembly line. All right, so how do we analyze a process that is a multi-step process? So instead of thinking of the sandwich assembly as a single employee assembling the, the entire sandwich by him or herself, uh, what if we had multiple steps? I look back into all those items that needed to be, um, all those activities required to finish a sandwich, assembling a sandwich, and I'm going to divide that into chunks. Uh, and each chunk will correspond into a work center or a workstation. So in this one particular case, we have three employees. So this is a um, setup that is well known um, when assembling a sandwich. Uh, each one of them will be serving each customer. Um, and let's assume for now that the, de the demand is 100 customers per hour, okay? So this is gonna be making things a little bit more complicated, right? But think, think of this for a moment. Instead of having one single employee processing uh, a sandwich every 120 seconds, maybe you wanna have three employees, uh, each one of them, performing a smaller number of tasks, right? So let's look at how, how uh, this has been set up according to the example from the book. So first employee uh, takes about 37 seconds, uh, greets the customer, takes the order, get the bread, cut the bread, the meat and cheese. Then the second one basically adds all of the salads, uh, wrap it up, and then the third one, uh, employee um, offers a value meal, cookie, and, and then checks out the customer, right? So observe that what we have right now <clears throat> is each unit has its unique processing time. So we're moving from the 120 seconds into three separate processing times for each one of those work centers, okay? So just as before, uh, now we can compute the capacity for each one of these steps. So, uh, so 37 seconds per customer, 46 seconds per customer, and 37 seconds per customer. So we can uh, move forward. Uh, so let's think in terms of capacity right now. So if capacity is one divided by processing time, then one divided by 35, 37 seconds, uh, basically represents 0 0.027 customers per second. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's hard to understand, but if we convert this to customers per hour, we get 93 customers per hour. Uh, so you move, so here are uh, customers arriving, here's your demand arriving. Uh, you go through the first step, uh, now we have a second step and then a third step, okay? And then you leave. So the second process, again, is to take 46 seconds. That was the processing time. So the capacity is the inverse. Uh, converting that from seconds to hour, you get 78.3 customers per hour. Uh, and the third step, again, 37 seconds, um, converting that into customers per second, doesn't mean much, but customers per hour, it does mean a little bit more. So 97.3 customers per hour. So what you need to observe now, um, that each resource has its own capacity, right? So now what is the overall capacity of the process? 
here's the big trick and it's going to hint towards the idea of the bottleneck uh, your process capacity is always the smallest one always always the smallest one so for the first stage i could handle 97 uh, customers per hour the second stage 73 uh, sorry 78 customers per hour and then uh, the third step 97 customers per hour so by intuition let's think about this Let, let's push demand through this process so if my demand is a hundred customers per hour uh, the very first step I'm pushing hundred customers per hour but only 97.3 come out of this process. Now I'm going to try to push these 97.3 customers per hour through the second stage, but only 78.3 come out. Okay. Now I'm going to push these 78.3 customers per hour through 97.3 customers per hour. What am I going to be observing at the end of this assembly line? Uh, I would not be seeing 97.3 because only 78.3 came through. So uh, by the end of this process, I will have 78.3 customers per hour. This is the capacity of my process. Okay. So observe that what, what I'm doing is I'm pushing demand through this process. Okay. Uh, we will be seeing later in this course where you can pull and instead of focusing on capacity, we, we could be focusing on tech times, tech times. Uh, but for now, let's push demand through a process. So here's my capacity. It's the smallest uh, amount. All right. Now the bottleneck is the resource with the lowest capacity in a process. Uh, so Let's understand uh, the location of the bottleneck as being the critical point. It's the decision um, making point, and that should be the focus of the operations manager. Um, <clears throat> because if you look at any process, the bottleneck is the most likely place that will constrain you from achieving your highest efficiency. Everything else from this process will be somewhat idle. I could be working at a, pay, at a rate of 97 customers per hour, but I'm only working at 78 customers per hour, right? So there is, people are idle. Resources are being idle. So here's the example of airport security. Um, airport security, you verify your, your ID and boarding pass. That's the first step. And then you move, second step, uh, searching passenger for metal objects and using some kind of scanner and then the third step uh carrying on luggage through the x-ray machine so when you think in terms of airport security there's always these very long waiting times right and we will observe long queues um when we arrive into security so a few things are being involved over there one of them is if there is a queue, it means the arrival rate um, is very close, or at least from a transient state, um, higher than the capacity of the process, right? So anytime that you observe queues, that hints you uh, that there might be something wrong. When, so when, our when we're talking about customers, we observe queues. When we're talking about um, products, we observe working process inventory, right? So the bottleneck would be the place accumulating the most amount of working process inventory and the most amount of queues. So in general, a resource may have a utilization of less than 100%, uh, and this may happen for perhaps one or two reasons. So, <clears throat> so maybe you have extra capacity. So this is the case where, where demand is less than your capacity. Or in a demand constraint process, um, even the bottleneck will not be working at 100%. So the idea is you can be constrained 
by demand or you can be constrained by capacity, okay? So even if a process is constrained by demand, we might think of the demand being the bottleneck. In that case, one might argue that the single resource in the process should be, no single resource should be called a bottleneck. Here's the tricky part though. Uh, you can always establish the step of the process that has the highest utilization or in other words, the lowest capacity. So uh, the resource with the lowest capacity becomes your bottleneck and becomes your focus uh, point in your process. So every process has a bottleneck, even if the capacity constraint created by the bottleneck may not be binding. In other words, uh, all processes have a bottleneck because it doesn't matter how many steps you have in your process, that bottleneck with respect to capacity will dictate the pace of your process. So looking back to that weird example that I was showing you before, uh, everything is gonna run at this rate, no matter what you do. So finding the bottleneck is a key, even if it's not at 100% utilization. So let's look at the, <clears throat> the sandwich assembly problem right now. Uh, and I'm gonna, do a more formal analysis of this process um, of the sandwich assembly. So we know the processing time here is, this is 37 seconds per uh, customer. Work center number one, work center number two is 46 seconds per customer. Work center number three is again, 37 seconds per customer, okay? Now the capacity of that in minutes, uh, all you gotta do, <clears throat> so you gotta switch this around uh, and would be one over 37, all of that times uh, <clears throat> uh, 60 seconds uh, per customer. Uh, so you, you can find the capacity per minute for each one of these still wouldn't represent much to you, but you can think in terms of a capacity per hour. So the capacity per hour, if you multiply this again um, by uh, 60 minutes within an hour, you get to the 97.3 customers per hour. This guy is 78.3 customers per hour. And this guy again, 97.3 customers per hour. Now, what is the utilization rate? Uh, and can we find bottlenecks? Perfect. So first and foremost, observe demand and let's figure out what the capacity is. So what is the capacity of this process? We had established before that the capacity is the minimum capacity in the process. So like I said, uh, we're gonna be trying to push 100 customers per hour in this process, but only 97.3 come through, only 78.5 come through. And even though your capacity here is 97.3, you're only gonna be observing 78, uh, <clears throat> sorry, 78.3, 78.3, customers per minute leaving this assembly line. So this is eventually, this is your capacity, okay? So uh, let's think in terms of utilization rates. Uh, <coughs> and in order for us to do this, I found out what this capacity is, 78.3. The demand is 100 uh, units. So I can figure out what my flow rate it's and the flow rate is the minimum between capacity and demand. So again, the minimum between 100, uh, the demand is 100 and the capacity is 78.3. So my flow rate is 78.3 customers per hour. All right, now let's think in terms of utilization. So what are we going to do in terms of utilization? 78. 
0.3 divided by 97.3. So this is going to be equals to roughly 80.4%. So utilization is your, uh, <clears throat> your flow rate divided by your capacity, okay? Now work center number two, this is 78.3 divided by 78.3. So this is 100% utilization. And then next one, we already calculated before, 78.3 divided by 97.3 this therefore uh, becomes 80.4 percent right so where is my bottleneck is the one with the highest utilization rate so this is my bottleneck right here so work center is not a work center one is not a bottleneck work center two is a bottleneck i'm running at a hundred percent utilization and this guy isn't. Now, very important. Are there two bottlenecks in a process? No, there will never be two bottlenecks in a process. There will never be a hundred bottlenecks. There is only one bottleneck at every single time. If you happen to solve that bottleneck and increase the capacity of the process, then the bottleneck moves someplace else. Okay, most likely downstream from where you're working. Uh, and cycle time is one divided by flow rate, which therefore is one divided by 78.3. And this is a very weird value of 0 0.0127, uh, which doesn't mean anything, right? because we're uh, hours per customer. So let's multiply this by 60. So let's figure out what this is in terms of uh, <clears throat> um, minute, uh, hours per customer. Uh, and <clears throat> eventually what we get in terms of cycle time is roughly about 46 uh, seconds per customer. So that's the interval of time that you're going to be observing in between uh, your uh, customers in the sandwich assembly line. Now, as I was saying before, if you are, um, if, if you are the manager of this process, all you got to do is observe that interval of time. If every 46 seconds on average, you're observing a customer leaving the cashier with, with her meal, you know your assembly line is working well, your process is working well. If it starts to go up, then you know there's a problem in your process, right? So um, this is a very, very important metric in a process because you can control and you can decide immediately, you can intervene immediately if you know what your cycle time is. So moving on, uh, now what if I want to look at this problem from a demand perspective and I say, okay, so how long does it take to uh, produce a certain amount of units, and, um, you know, quantity uh, Q of units? So the formula is very simple. If you know what your cycle time is, so the time to make Q units is your cycle time times the number of units um, you are inquiring about. So in this one example, <coughs> uh, uh, what if I need to uh, produce uh, 20 uh, sandwiches? So how long is this gonna take? Well, it's, this is gonna take <coughs> 12, um, sorry, 120 seconds per customer in the case of the single employee, seconds per customer times 20, uh, in this case, customers. So we can observe, this is gonna be 2,400 seconds or roughly uh, 40 minutes. And on the other hand, if we go into the three work center um, in tandem, 
like we had before in this one particular example. Uh, and my cycle time is 46 seconds per customer per unit, this guy over here. Uh, then the time to produce 20 units will therefore be 46 seconds uh, per customer times uh, those 20 uh, customers coming through. So this is going to be roughly 900 uh, and 20 seconds or um, something like about 15.3 minutes, right? So this is an interesting way of seeing things where um, by dividing the assembly in between three stages, I was able to deliver a lot more uh, product a lot faster, right? So here's the importance of what we call balancing the assembly line. Uh, this is a problem that we're going to be seeing in the next video, where is there a way that I can improve um, this performance even still? So um, as I hinted before, when you push things through, your worry is your cycle time. It's the pace of your assembly. But if you're pulling units through your system, you're going to be thinking in terms of your tech time. Or in other words, you should worry about what is the pace of the demand. This is what matters, not the pace of your capacity. So you work your way around. If I know what my demand is, then I'm going to work uh, backwards into my process and cycle this process in a way to match what my demand is. So uh, uh, line balancing is a very interesting problem we're going to be seeing in the next uh, lesson. Uh, there's an algorithm to solve the uh, line balancing problem. And then there's also an optimization um, method to, um, to balance a, a line. Uh, using, you can use solver in Excel. It's a very interesting uh, problem indeed. So in summary, if you define the flow unit, uh, you can observe all the steps from your process uh, with the same uh, unit. Therefore, you can compare them and you can observe uh, their performance. You draw the process, so it helps you to visualize uh, your overall operation in your company. The cycle time is the beat of that process. It's the pace, it's the rhythm. So if you know what your cycle time is, as a manager, you can observe cycle times and uh, right from the spot, you are able to define uh, if there's something going on uh, in your, your, you know, in your uh, operations. And the bottleneck is always the point of intervention. That is where you're going to be making decisions. If you find bottlenecks, you can perhaps uh, define and allocate more resources. You can allocate. So there could be resources. That could be technology. That could be employees. Anyway, you can make investments. It's always the bottleneck that will be your constraint in your process. And last but not least, variance in the process. What happens to inventory um, if instead of talking um, with fixed values, we start talking about averages? What if we add variance to the process? Remember the process triangle. As you increase variability, you would be increasing uh, inventory. So a process that is balanced is all fine and good. But if there is variance within each one of those steps, you will observe higher inventory. You will observe working process inventory going up. And we don't want that to happen. And we will be able to analyze that with queuing theory and then later on with lean operations and Toyota production systems. So also line balancing will help reduce your cycle times as you divide all those activities into smaller chunks and therefore you can speed up your process that way. So thank you very much.
And if you have any questions, please let me know.